Hey, aloha, and welcome back to the Think Tech Hawaii studios. I'm your guest host, Andrew, the security guy. Uh, this is going to be another very interesting episode of Security Matters Hawaii. We have one of North America's, I think, foremost thought leaders in workplace violence with us today. Felix Nader, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Andrew. I love the introduction. Yeah, we had uh, we we really tried to bring Felix to you live. We had a little bit of a technical thing with our video this morning, so uh, you're going to see his smiling face during the episode, and hopefully more of that than you're going to see mine. Um, so we'll um, we'll go ahead and get into this a little bit, um, Felix. Most of most of the audience that'll see this, I think, probably knows you and your work. But um, for those folks in Hawaii who may not know of you, want to give us just a little bit of your background and um, sort of uh, the, the the passion that drives you to work in this part of our industry. Fantastic. Yes, let me let me do it very briefly. So I'm a retired United States Postal Inspector that uh, worked in criminal safety, security, uh, administrative areas during my 26 years. The last eight years was, was spent specializing in what I do now in uh, workplace violence prevention from the uh, senior members of the organization right on down to the workforce. I retired February of 2001 with, with no aspirations of doing anything other than just uh, my honey do list for my bride. <laughs> yeah, awesome. yeah. September 11 came around mm. and I started receiving some phone calls from the Postal Service asking me to please consider uh, submitting a, a proposal to do some uh, security assessments on Long Island in light of the uh, anthrax scare and the uh, assessment and evaluation of their facilities. And that was now about 17 years ago. I only intended to be around for just that one project, and the word got out that I was uh, involved in this stuff again as a consultant, and here I am. So my passion on this is I found out early on that it's all about leadership. It's all about uh, dismantling the communication problems associated with effectively implementing what I call comprehensive, not complicated, comprehensive approach that involves the little guy on the bottom and the senior member of the organization on top communicating. And I term, I term my process IC3LE, uh, in integration, collaboration, coordination, communication, leadership, and then how we collectively execute. So that's my consulting model. How's that, Andrew? That's beautiful. I um, I'm interested to know what the initial um, uh, response was from the community. You know, when you brought in a holistic holistic purpose. I remember not you know 9/11 well, and you know the the world thought, wow, government should fix this for us, and uh, everyone should fix this for us. And it took a while for us to realize this is going to be a holistic top to bottom sort of effort, and we're going to have to have everyone involved, every stakeholder in our ecosystem in order to really um, secure ourselves better, to get a more secure posture. Um, so tell me a little bit about the, 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 the early, uh, I guess, introduction uh, to, to folks about, you know, what you were trying to share. Yeah. So by accident, because I never do anything uh, intentional, always by accident, <laughs> the Postal Service, you know, back in mid-80s uh, and up until 1997, was caught up in a, in a series of issues involving the homicidal threat. And um, it was a decision that came down from, from Congress. You know, either the Postal Service does something or we're going to give the whole entity of uh, safety and security to the FBI. Wow. The chief inspector decided that we, we as an organization, from the Postmaster General to the chief inspector's uh, office, we needed to take wrap our arms around this and take the the assessments that were rendered by the Congress and, uh, and, uh, and look at how we best could um, uh, tackle it from a senior level manager perspective right on down to the field. So they identified uh, uh, field inspectors, and I was one of them, in the 39 divisions that would be trained specifically in all the aspects of uh, violence and behavioral stuff that was associated with uh, our ability to, uh, to assess uh, and, and determine the best mitigation recommendations we can make consistent with the need not to be aggressive in the law enforcement approach, but influential in the uh, employee and manager relationship aspect to get buy-in. 
uh, that went along with the need to consistently go to schools to learn the, the state of the art of what was going on in the area of psychology, psychiatry, behavior, and all that good stuff that went along with it. So when I transitioned into my current work, it was easy for me to communicate with senior members of an organization because I learned not to talk at them, but talk to them, dismantling the law enforcement lingo and effectively communicating on their terms. That's, that's where I'm at now, and I'm enjoying it. I really am. That's amazing. Yeah, the, I think the need um, for, I guess, an understanding of, of people in distress, you know, let's just let's start there. Um, you know, it, it, yeah. businesses and organizations have a, a, a mission to fulfill. You know, they're, they're m perhaps profit driven, although we've seen, a, I see a, a few hundred CEOs sign something saying they weren't so interested in stakeholder profit anymore recently, which so we'll see where that goes. But, um, yes. you know, the, the, to get the organization off of its, off of its business bent and say, wow, this is an organization of its people. We need to take care of our people first. Um, how, how did you go about bringing that message to, to this organization at first? And then how has that, How's that grown for you? Uh, communicating that the you know the needs of these these people who are are struggling you know with something in their life that's causing them some disgruntlement or some um, you know they're they're um, they're maybe on that that escalating path that we talk about sometimes towards violence. Um, how how yeah. was that received? I mean, it sounds like quite an expense to me. You know, if I'm a business owner, right? Like, wow, I've got to now take care yeah. of the needs of everyone yeah. all of a sudden. Yes, yes. That's a very interesting uh, question because it is true. M most of the time, it's difficult to interpret what it is that I'm saying that they need to do. So the interested ideal client that calls me and says, we want to know more about how to best implement what you're talking about. How, what do you suggest? And I start from the top helping them understand that a policy is really a, a piece of paper that's meaningless mm -hmm. uh, unless senior management from the C-suite down to the directors really understand that it's about walking in someone's shoes and understanding where they're coming from. Wow. Yeah. And so the policy, yeah, so the policy needs to look at the employee's uh, potential at-risk environment, whether it's in the building, at the warehouse, at the office, on the street, or in some uh, patient environment, they need to look at it from their point of view and then create a, a pull mechanism that says, here's the linear contact that you have to me that whenever you have an issue, no matter how dumb it may sound, we want to hear about it. That's the only way this is going to work, Andrew. Yeah, it's interesting. I, 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 I talk about this with our team and, you know, that, that um, there's fear of sharing that, you know, hey, I'm having a problem, you know, I'm struggling. And, and I think in a lot of workforce yep. environments um, and, and family environments, for, you know, for that matter, like the people that are sort of closest to you that you spend a lot of time with are, are probably some of the first ones that recognize that, you know, you're off and can say, hey, is everything OK? And then and then actually wait for you to answer, yep. you know, and then be willing to engage yep. with you in in a discussion about, you know, what's going on. And then maybe, you know, it's not like I don't think telling on someone as much as it is guiding them to get some help. Um, and I, I don't yeah. know, was that, um, you know, you've been, you've been at this for many years. Was that easier yeah. then than it is now? Is it, is it always been a, a piece of the, of the puzzle that we have to negotiate and teach? Um, on, for our team, we've had yeah. to do a lot of training around that type of communication, you know, that vulnerability, making exactly. it okay. Yes, yes, you're right. So for myself, uh, I went through what I, what I call a, a paradigm shift. Mm. I, I had to lobotomize myself. I, you know, I was comfortable in telling people what to do. I was comfortable in directing operations. I was comfortable in putting myself in at-risk situations, you know, working undercover, leading, you know, serious kinds of arrest situations. I was comfortable doing that. But then when I transitioned over to this thing, workplace violence as a postal inspector, I had to de-emphasize the me and focus on the them. Mm. You know, how, how does the supervisor deal with this situation? How does the employee trust or have the lack of confidence in, how do we overcome that lack of confidence in the, postal, in the organization's ability to provide for their safety? And, and then dismantling the ineffective communication links that still exist, mm. wh whether it's uh, horizontally or vertically, where the security guys are always directing and telling, and the HR guys are building up the wall saying, stop, you know, <laughs> we need to work together. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah, we need to understand how this all works. So while it's easy to talk about the what all the time, what's more difficult, and that's to your point, Andrew, what's more difficult is the how and the why. You know, why does someone let things rise to this level? Why do lay people do not understand how to connect the dots because they don't know what's moving forward without having any experience? It's the common sense response that I give. Mm-hmm. Why does management not, you know, do more? Well, it's probably because the people who are out there connecting with managers initially are talking about the what and not the why or the how. Mm. And yeah. the why and the how is intrinsically tied to how they are, are, they're perceiving their needs and how we're going to integrate with uh, the perception of their needs so we, so we can work as a team. So most of my introduction with ongoing client work takes months before I actually go into the field because I spend my time working within the organization, changing the culture, improving the philosophy, and creating a mindset. Mm. Amazing. Yeah, that's, um, and, and I, I like that. that that's a month-long process. Do you, do you primarily work in enterprise? Uh, and have you worked with small businesses? And do you find that your process is still the same, maybe quicker when they're smaller? But, but basically, you've got to, uh, you still got to get that buy-in at the top and that broad acceptance before you can get anything that people trust at the bottom? Yes. So my process is applicable across the, you know, across the, 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 the workplace, whether it's a school, a hospital. The process is the same. Hmm. It's just uh, to, to narrow it down specifically to address their unique concern. So, for example, so I'm working with a, a client of 11 years. Initially, they had a training problem, and then they, they asked me to continually assess and evaluate their needs to the point where we're actually uh, developing training programs on an annual basis that fix problems from their incidents and experiences the prior year. Okay. So it all depends on what their needs might be. Sometimes a, a company may just want a training program. You have to, at least I have to assess and evaluate what is it that they want to change, what do they want to improve, and why do they need this training program? If I, once I understand that, then I, I sit down with them and, and I say to them, the root cause of our discussion really isn't the training program. I think it might be the ineffective integration and collaboration of your management team in knowing how to handle these situations and building that trust and confidence. I can do the training as long as you're committed to developing approaches and changing the mindset that creates a communication dialogue. Mm. How, how often do you find that the sort of primary communication channel is broken or untrusted? Is that like just more often than not? Or what's your, what's your feeling about that? So you, you read a lot about my unintentional consequences. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is, is that sometimes we think we're talking to people, but my acronym is is ACE. We make assumptions based upon what we know, what we're saying, and we expect people to interpret and know what we're saying and then Mm. execute. Mm. You know, and then there's, you know, the, and then there's the compromise, you know, factors. Okay, so now he tells me to do something. He doesn't give me the resource. And then I'm supposed to go out and get this thing done. And I don't really understand what it is he, he or she wants me to, you know, to complete. Wow. Mm-hmm. And so the expediency in, in the realm of safety, and, and I apply it to, secu- to security, says, okay, so now this dummy who doesn't communicate me to me, he makes assumptions, and he doesn't give me the resources, and he tells me to get the job done. Okay, so I'm going to go out here and get the job done the best way I know, cuts corners because it's expedient for him to cut corners Mm. in order for him to be effective. And before you know it, they're placing themselves at a safety risk in the workplace, Mm -hmm. or they might be cutting corners uh, in their their environments dealing with the public. And I'll give you an example. So they have a perfectly good operating air conditioning system in their vehicles in the summertime, but because they like to drive around with their windows, they invite the robber to jump on the running board or to put the gun to the window and hold them up. That's mm-hmm. expediency. Sure. That's making an assumption, you know, and, and so it's all about understanding what other people are going through and do what we did in the Army. You tell someone what you want done, you ask them do they understand, you rephrase what you tell them, and you ask them again do they understand, so that when they go out there, they have self-confidence in knowing what the tasks are and what their execution requirements are. 
Wow. Yeah, I love the idea of building some self-confidence around, you know, the issues of dealing with workplace violence in an organization. Hey, we are talking with Felix Nader. We're going to take about a one-minute break and take, uh, go pay some bills, and uh, we'll be right back. Stay with us. Thanks to our ThinkTech underwriters and grantors, the Atherton Family Foundation, Carol Monley and the Friends of ThinkTech, the Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education, Collateral Analytics, the Cook Foundation, Dwayne Carisu, the Hawaii Community Foundation, the Hawaii Council of Associations of Apartment Owners, Hawaii Energy, the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, Hawaiian Electric Company, Integrated Security Technologies, Galen Ho of BAE Systems, Kamehameha Schools, MW Group, the Scheidler Family Foundation, the Sydney Stern Memorial Trust, Volo Foundation, Yuriko J. Sugimura. Thanks so much to you all. Hey, aloha, and welcome back to Security Matters Hawaii. We're having a great discussion today with Felix Nader from Nader Associates Limited. Um, this workplace violence issue is, is sprawling out in, into the media. You see it, you see active shooter incidents, you see workplace shooter incidents, and, and, and we, we read about violence in the home, violence in our schools. Um, this is a, a major problem, and, and we, we touched on the fact that organizations have, have um, recognized it, and they're beginning to push down on their management team to figure out ways to deal with it, and oftentimes that's a long-term process. So if you're doing that in your organization, Get some professional help. Don't just expect that the, the person or persons that you have tasked with dealing with this can help have these conversations with folks inside your organization that are truly in need. And in the second half, I want to focus on that a little bit more um, with Felix and the things that he's seen out there. The, the problems that people bring to the workplace, Felix, um, how, how often would mm -hmm. you say they're truly caused by the workplace? Oh my goodness gracious, um, one in seven employee <laughs> feels unsafe in the workplace. Okay. One in seven employee feels unsafe in the workplace. Yeah. And, and that's directly correlated to assumptions made by those responsible for the workplace that everything is okay. Mm. Um, but, but, what buffers, but what buffers that inability to rectify those situations are assumptions that are age old, age old and one being zero tolerance. Mm. So management thinks that zero tolerance is an effective tool. It is a legal construct that holds the organization within certain requirements. I, I get that. But here's, here's how the employee sees zero tolerance. So Felix has an ongoing problem at home with his spouse, and, and co-workers are very, very close to one another know that this is going on. And Felix gets to a point where his spouse says, honey, if you don't you know, straighten up, I'm going to leave your butt. Mm -hmm. And the escalation of emotions, and one of the female co-workers of mine discovers from uh, my wife that um, I threatened her. Mm -hmm. And this wife, co-worker, comes to me and says, I don't know what to do with this, but I want to give you some advice so that it doesn't interfere with the workplace. Because I'm not going to drop a dime on you, because if I do, management is going to go after you aggressively, and then you're going to be disciplined. Mm -hmm. So you see the negativity of this of this tolerance zero tolerance policy. Sure. It actually pushes down the reporting of what employees should want to convey out of fear that if they report it and something goes awry and Felix becomes angry, who's going to protect me? Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to be the victim of retaliation and the brunt of Felix's anger. So it's really nice to say. And it's important to have it when you get down the road of, of that disgruntled person who is failing to repair their behavior. I, I get that. Mm -hmm. But you've got to come up with a better approach of communicating effectively that induces employees to want to be uh, a contributing member of their workplace safety and their workplace security. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. You know, I see, you know, lots of different wellness programs and, and typically they, they're focused around like fitness or health or food. And a lot of times uh, some that I've seen and we expanded on hours years ago to sort of include um, things like church and meditation and social interaction. You know, how many. So we reward people for joining new clubs and, you know, meeting new people, things like that. 
So I'm I'm interested in your uh, your opinion of the 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 workforces. Uh, I guess mm, I, said, I don't didn't think this through, but the the breadth with which they're willing to support an employee's uh, wellness, you know, health and wellness. You know, it's there's a lot of opportunities for people yeah. to find help, and I, I feel like sometimes uh, the, maybe the organizations don't don't support it or, or don't put enough mm, what would you call a real emphasis behind that support. True, um, but it's a it's a it's a two way uh, combination okay. of communication. The employee the employee has to want to honestly drop his problems honestly on her lap. Sure. So that okay. the supervisor or manager can then assess and evaluate the breadth and scope of what the person is going through to understand why they, they are no longer coming to work as much, coming in late often. Their production and the efficiency has dropped, their morale has dropped. So when, once the honesty is conveyed and there's dialogue, it's, it's easy for that supervisor to do one of two things with a productive or formally productive employee. What can I do for you? And will you participate in the things that we need to get done to make you better? Mm -hmm. that, that is the, 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 the recommended approach to creating that, that roadway where an employee says, I know I'm not getting along with my wife, but I know if I go to Supervisor Andrew, he is empathetic. He's going to understand because his, the company supports everything that I am going to convey. And they're going to have uh, opportunities for me to go to EAP, uh, uh, opportunities for me to be a coach and, to be coach and counsel. And so I feel good about this company because they feel good about me. Mm -hmm. The problem arises when there is an assumption made, made on work performance and work performance alone that that employee has turned disgruntled and is no longer interested in being part of the organization's focus. Mm. That is a bad assumption without asking, what can we do for you? Is there something going on beyond the workplace that we need to know? Totally you take agree. the issue of mental health. Right? You take the issue of mental health. It is sad to blame mental health. When you know the statistics, you know that less than 1% um, actually commit violent crime. Sure. And you take a look at the number of people who are actually involved uh, based against the number of incidents that are reported who don't ever rise to a level of physical violence, let alone homicidal violence. But in the workplace, our failure to properly train supervisors in the recognition of suicide uh, recognition signs and mental health recognition signs. We go after the unproductive employee who is who, who is predisposed to worry about those issues and label that person a problem child, causing that person to internalize their feelings, and mm. then they become management's aggressive focus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even more isolated within the organization. More. <clears throat> more isolated within the organization, which is why when I initially get brought in to consult with these, high, uh, with these organizations, I always emphasize the importance of having somebody in charge that has oversight responsibility. I, I don't mean a security director, and I don't mean an HR director. I mean someone within the organization, and it could be either or both, that has a commitment and investment to doing what you and I do, Andrew, and that is listening before act accusing listening before we draw conclusions, and then listening to why an employee who has a, a, good, a good route delivering newspapers for argument's sake, why is he having problems out there? Mm -hmm. Could it be we don't know this person once they leave the organization and they're out dealing with the public? So we've got to create these, these, ab these avenues and opportunities to engage one another in a more efficient and effective way that dismantles the communication barriers. Mm-hmm. Let's, um, I agree 100%. Let's uh, just touch on quickly since we're, you know, sort of security based. Um, you know, I think there's a, also a lack of reporting when you're having a problem perhaps with a spouse. And, and we've had instances where that spouse or, or significant other or uh, maybe some other person from another contracting organization or something comes to an organization yeah. basically targeting one person, but then ends up uh, exacting some violence on people along the way, people in the path. Uh, perhaps that, that you know blocked the door or were just unfortunately in the way um and i i, I don't know is, is there um is there um do you do you come across organizations that understand that need to collect this information because that the the threat may not really be the employee it could be the employee's family or a family member something like that is there a lot of um, emphasis put on that as well 
I, I think reporting is a huge challenge, and it's a huge challenge from the standpoint mm. of privacy and sure. confidentiality and whistleblower and Title Seven. So I, I challenge the HR director to do be creative and innovative in managing all those um, those requirements that call for you to protect people's privacy and confidentiality. So as to do what we did as postal inspectors in the postal service, you know, we were surrounded by non-security, non-law enforcement types, and we deputized them. But mm. we learned from them in terms of what their problems were, and we were able to share confidential information in that environment that allowed us to build a bridge of miscommunication to effectively bring them on board so that they wouldn't be afraid of telling you things that they learned that might be sensitive. Right now, the, the, the gap in our ability to effectively be ahead of these issues long before they become a disgruntled a transition over to an active shooter is our inability to track these incidents sufficiently. Mm. Out of, without the fear of violating someone's privacy or confidentiality. Yeah, that's, I, the big, that's the big concern. Yeah, I guess that becomes sort of like personal health care information at that point if they've been counseled. And I know we've I've been seeing that more in the media where, you know, and you talked about the sort of the lack of, of correspondence between mental illness and someone actually becoming violent. But I think there is that yes. that we're, we're, we're wading through the protecting of that information, you know, inside of an organization. You know, we've got about a minute. Being, we've got about a minute or a sure. minute and a half left. So I'd like to uh, maybe uh, just take some time and give your your, your final thoughts on what um, you know from your expertise. What you think the community uh, could do? What business leaders should be doing? And you know, what are, what are the things you think that uh, you know some of the best advice that we can all take forward uh, to make our community safer? Two two things very quickly. If you're going to conduct active shooter training. You know, make that actual true to training, uh, the skills they acquire transferable to any setting, whether you're in a movie theater, a public place, a mall, so that the content they receive in that active shooter training program in the workplace is sufficiently uh, presented so that the employee understands what he or she could do when they're in an outside environment. And, and number two, recognize this, that when you use that word termination, uh, rather than separation, you've already conveyed to that employee that's being terminated that they're a bad apple. Mm. And, and so the, you effectively convince that individual that whatever they do now becomes management's responsibility because they labeled me as a bad apple. Mm -hmm. and, and know this along with that. The nonsense of being able to recognize uh, warning signs and, and, and behaviors are good up until, if you want to marry it to the five stages, up until stage three in the active shooter mindset. Mm -hmm. After that, they become, as my good friend John Byrne says, they internalize their intention so that nobody can identify either the day, the hour, or the moment when they're going to strike. Yep. Yeah, very, very so true. So prevention program up front is important. Yeah, so folks, that's it. This is um, this is um, uh, a topic where we all need to take time to be our brother's keeper. Um, please take some of the advice that uh, Felix shared with us today with you, and um, be safe out there. Felix, thanks again. Aloha, everybody. Take care. Thanks.